but I see our boy Frank Saravalli. He's chomping at the bit to talk about Jack Campbell. He joins us on the Star Mechanical in uh, guest line. You can find out more info about Star Mechanical and everything that makes them the number one plumbing and heating company in Emden by going to starmechanical.ca. We now bring our number one hockey insider onto the show. Frank, have you picked your jaw up off the floor after seeing Jack Campbell cleared waivers? Um, no, it was didn't move. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wasn't I was, even surprised to see him hit waivers. Really? Yeah, that, that was going to be my next question. Like, I was surprised a little bit at the timing of it. We joked that it was Stuart Skinner who had the bad night against Vancouver. And then it was like, and Jack, you're going to the minors. Um, but it was time to send a message to this team. And I think on top of giving Campbell a chance to reset, doing this allow or doing this does send a message to that locker room, doesn't it? Well, I think that's really the biggest thing is there was no way to allow the way this unraveled to continue. Yeah. And there's no guarantee that this fixes it or at least even gets it rolling in the right direction, but you have to do something. You can't sit idle. And so, you know, you're right. Jack Campbell, whatever we may think of his game, which isn't much, at least for me, um, he's still an incredibly popular player in that dressing room. The guys really like him. He's usually pretty positive and upbeat, and he's, by all accounts, a good teammate. So the Oilers were faced with a decision. The goaltending is last in the league. Statistically, and maybe even by eye test, Campbell actually was probably better than Stuart Skinner this year so far. As crazy as that sounds. But they knew that they couldn't put Stuart Skinner through waivers because he'd never make it through. Yeah. So the only option to create the cap space to give this team a jolt was to put Campbell on waivers. And now I think he's kind of got a month to figure himself out. And in the meantime, they're hoping that everyone else in that room gets a little pissed off and says, hey, it stinks that Jack Campbell had to pay the price for the rest of us with all the different miscues and poor play that we've had. I don't like seeing anyone pay the price for that. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I'm not sure if, if there even is an answer to this, but is this the end for Campbell in Edmonton? Like, is this a play where they're sending him down and they go, we're done with him. He's staying in the minors all year and we're buying him out as soon as we can this summer. Or is this something where they're hoping he can get his game back? Well, they're definitely hoping he can get his game back because that's the easiest path here. You sign a player to a five-year, $25 million deal, and you're 16 months into it, you were literally banking on him being a rock-solid core piece for this team moving forward. That hasn't been the case almost since day one that he arrived in Edmonton. And I think the tough part now, or the real answer to your question now, is that it relies or lies totally with Jack Campbell. How does he play when he gets back to the AHL? He's no stranger to being there. He's sort of had to go and find himself multiple times. I'd argue that I don't think whatever we see from Campbell is a physical thing. I don't think it's a technical thing. I think so much of Campbell's issues are mental. And I don't know if it's possible to fix that in, in a one-month stint, but I think they're hoping that away from the glare, away from the spotlight of Edmonton, that he at least has an opportunity to do so. And so I think they're taking a look at this from 30,000 feet and saying, we're in a tough situation. Ideally, we'd have an answer on Jack Campbell and his game kind of by December 1st. And hopefully in the meantime, the team has turned a corner, Campbell's game has turned a corner, and we can swap out Campbell for um, Cal Pickard, and it'll be like nothing ever happened. But if Campbell doesn't play well and doesn't recover, I don't think for one second the Oilers are going to hesitate to pull the trigger and by whatever means necessary end up having to move capital to get him off of their books because that's also standing in the way of whatever other transactions they'd like to make and potentially standing in the way of making the playoffs. If you need to get a better goalie, you're going to have to spend to do it. And they recognize that's going to be expensive. And so the easiest solution for everyone involved is for the solution to be internal. 
Uh, over the last 24 hours or so, obviously, with Campbell now being gone, the, the rumors have gone through the roof, Frank. I'm sure you've heard a lot of them, but Jordan Binnington, Jake Allen, and uh, who's another one, Carter Hart. Like, how aggressively are the Oilers now looking at the goalie market and are any of those targets realistic ones? I don't think they've... Well, I, I know they haven't been aggressive to this point. I think that they've you know, in, in internal conversations have probably been looking at this saying, okay, what would a list potentially look like? And I think the list is probably a lot larger than just some of the names that you mentioned. Um, I personally don't think there are like, I don't, I don't get excited about any of the names that you mentioned, maybe outside of Carter Hart, but Carter mm -hmm. Hart also from Edmonton kind of has this whole other thing circling around him with, whatever Hockey Canada investigation may or may not eventually come to light um, that sort of has held up, I think, any discussion that anyone might have had on him. And I just think the Oilers recognize that doing so and getting to that point, it's going to cost them, and they'd prefer, if possible, to keep their powder dry for fixing some of the issues that we see probably in front of us on defense – or in the bottom six. The other thing this Jack Campbell decision has done, Frank, is it's totally taken the coaching change talk out of the market, at least for 24 hours. Things have quieted down on that front. Um, I feel, and this is just my gut, this is just me guessing, I feel like they need to win the next two in order for Jay Woodcroft to still be the coach when they return home from the road trip. Is that a fair assessment, or do you think I'm being excessive? No, I don't think you're being excessive. I think at varying points this season, uh, it's been a topic of conversation. I think um, the Oilers would prefer not to in their true heart of hearts. I think they think Jay Woodcroft is a good coach that has not just had some, this team has had bad luck, but really poor performances in front of him. And it can't always be on the coach. Um but at the same time, I think the true answer here is that everything's on the table, that the longer this goes on, the more they aren't making up ground, um, that they're going to be in big trouble. And the fact that we're kind of inching closer toward the quarter season mark and at some point here in the very near future, the conversation isn't going to be like home ice is out the window and probably finishing in the top three in your division is likely out the window just based on a pure math perspective. Like we're talking about squeaking into the playoffs the longer this drags on. In a season where it was cup or bust, like the failures here are, are epic. So you're talking about the most pressure packed season probably in Oilers history that they're going to have to try and sift their way through. And the quicker you can get it going, that's in everyone's best interest. And they're just trying to avoid if they can doing anything drastic, but at some point they're going to be left with no choice. Yeah. Certainly feels like we are uh, slowly getting to that point. Last night in Calgary, we saw Jonathan Huberto get sat down for the entire third period here. And it showed an element of accountability. And that word has become a bit of a buzzword here in Edmonton. A lot of people are pointing to the Evan Bouchard turnovers, the fact he basically never gets sat down for a full period. You know, lack of production from some guys high up in the lineup. Big guns never get sat down the way Huberto did. Do you think that's an issue in Edmonton? I've, I've just in talking to people, talking to the fan base, I get a lot of Jay Woodcroft isn't tough enough on, tough enough on this team. He lets the inmates run the asylum. Do you think that's part of the issue here? I personally don't. I think you have to let your players play. And I think when you make decisions like that to bench players, this is just my own personal philosophy and opinion is that it doesn't get easier for them to play. It gets harder because the next thing you're thinking about is making a mistake and being in the same spot again. Right. And so I always think about it like this, like Tyler, you golf, Liam, I'm not, I don't, do you golf Liam? Yep. Not well, but I golf. So if you're staring at a pond or a lake and you're like, don't hit the ball in the water, like what's the first thing you do is you hit the ball in the water. Drive it happens it down the middle. It, it's uncanny how that happens. Yeah. So you're thinking about all the things that could go wrong. And 
all that does is ratchet up the attention and the pressure on you to not do the same thing that you just did. And so I think personally players play at their best when th this is a game of mistakes. You know that mistakes are going to be made and you have the freedom and flexibility to do what you do best. And so that's kind of, it brings us back to Huberto and I'm never going to knock a coach for sitting him out because he felt like his team was in a better position to win. And sometimes that's required. But we talked about this on Daily Faceoff Live today. Now what? He's in the first year of an eight-year deal paying him $84 million. How do you put the pieces back together? Do you sit him out for a whole game? Do you play him until the wheels fall off at 24 minutes? It's easy to say, and it's easy, it's easy to do, I think. But then you're left with, now how do we fix this? And I think the Oilers should be in solution mode instead of sitting back and saying, let, let me just staple Evan Bouchard, our guy who could probably have 75 points this year, to the to the bench for what? Yeah, and I've always said another issue is that, you know, they're down in these games, they're trailing 4-2, and it's like, who? what defenseman gives you the best chance of hammering a puck into the back of the net? It's Bouch. Which forwards give you the best chance of coming back in a game? It's guys like Nuge earlier in the season, even a guy like Kane. So, I don't know. Liam, you had another one? I think I got a couple more for you, Frank, quickly. Um, so, obviously, there's more than the goaltending issue in Edmonton. So, would there be a possible address to the forward group that isn't scoring very well or potentially a defenseman coming in? Or are the Oilers just kind of hoping this just changes themselves too? Well, I I do think there's a part of it that they're saying, I, I hope this is a lightning rod for everyone. I think I framed it yesterday as a lightning rod up everyone's ass. Um, and potentially it is. But I'll, I'll go back to the same answer I had for you with Jay Woodcroft. I think truly everything is on the table. I think mm -hmm. you have an owner in Daryl Cates who is really impatient. And, you know, he probably wanted, if we're being honest, probably wanted heads to roll five games ago. Uh, we're dealing with a, um, a general manager in Ken Holland who by nature is very patient. And we're also dealing with the unknown in, in CEO of Hockey Ops, Jeff Jackson, who is new to the role, new to this position running a front office, but knows all of the pressures around and the realities of the start that they've had that I think there's a lot of things to sort of unpack there in terms of trying to actually predict what the Oilers do next. I'd say, you know, the first step after this one would be the coaching change. And then you'd be looking at more seismic moves, but that's just how I would stack it up right now. You mentioned asked, oh, okay, okay. Go, you go one more, really quickly. Do you think they can change things? Like, do you think this group is now capable of doing it after the start they've had? Because uh, what was it? Monday after Vancouver, it, it felt like a low seeing McDavid, Drysaddle, Hyman in the box at the same time. Woodcroft walked down the tunnel and, it's a frustrating time, obviously, but do you think this team is more than capable of it right now? I do. I, I haven't lost faith in that part of it. I think we all universally think, and and when I say we all, I say media, I say you guys, the fan base, GMs, agents, coaches that I talk to, everyone's like, why have they been this bad? And then you watch the first period when they're the first 12 minutes of it, at least, when they're up 19 to two in shots and playing almost a perfect game, there's a mental component to this, the fragility that's existed with this team. That is certainly concerning. I do think there's a physical aspect to this, something about McDavid and dry I don't know if it's physical injury, energy, whatever it might be. That part hasn't been right. Um, and I, I think this group collectively, we've seen them at their best, almost the same exact team why wouldn't they be able to duplicate or replicate some small part of that? You don't need to be the 14-0-1 team that ran through the league to close out the regular season. How about just like the 105-point team that we saw for you know the vast bulk of last season? You've seen that in little chunks and stretches this year. You saw it 
in the outdoor game for a, a big bulk of it. You saw it in the first period against Van. You saw it in the second game against Van, the one against Winnipeg. Like, go through the season, and there's certainly parts that you could, if you could, like, sort of, you know, pick little parts of each game and drop them into one complete 60 minute effort, it's there. They just haven't done it. And I think they can get there. But I think the reality of the NHL is that you've kind of got not eight, nine games to get there and and start to figure it out and trend in the right direction because you kind of need to hit the midway point at least at 500. And I think they're eminently capable of that. And if they can do that, then they should have no problem making the playoffs. Just quickly to wrap this up, because you mentioned Ken Holland being a patient GM, and I know the expectation or whatever, a lot of people expect this to be his last season, then off to retirement or whatever. He, even though he is a patient GM, he's not going to go down with the bat on his shoulders, right? Like, I mean, he's not going to sit there and just be like, ah, well, too late now. Like, I no. he should make a big move at some point. Yeah, I mean, look, he, I don't think he needed to be cajoled into thinking that, um, they needed some kind of change after the loss the other night in van. Um, I think he knew waking up that something had to be, had to be done. And this was the sort of easiest solution on the list, which it's the first box you check off to try on your, you know, if you're thinking of a pilot checklist and they've got the emergency list. Um, I don't know the exact order of things, I think they're hoping that they don't have to go further down and we'll see how this next week goes. Mm -hmm. um, this has been a very down edition of your, uh, of your segment on the show. We're all very gloomed out. So uh, danger suede wants me to lighten the mood. And before we let you go, ask you the hypothetical we chewed on the other day. If you were the man whose job it is to be Hunter, the Lynx, would you bring it up on first dates or would you wait a few? I'm definitely bringing it up on the first date. Yes, and I'm said. definitely bringing that costume over for a little role play <laughs> sesh. Wash it You're first. Done. Bye bye, Frank. Hey, look, uh, mascots you. I've learned are dangerous gropers. So we'll, uh, <laughs> just keep an eye on them. They're all there. You never know who's behind the mask. <laughs>